Well, thank you very much for having me here today. And thank you all for coming. I know it's sunny outside, so if that had happened in England, I can guarantee you no one would be here. Um, for me, it's really, um, now I'm a psychologist um, by training, so the reason why I'm interested in big data and the open source movement is really because it can tell us a lot about how people behave in their everyday lives and how that relates to something like more stable psychological traits that make people uniquely themselves. Um, so you can already tell that my talk is going to be a little different um, to the talks that you're probably going to hear over the course of the day, but I still hope that you enjoy it and that you learn something new about how data can relate to something like psychology. Okay, so now I want to start um, with a new story that I'm pretty sure that many of you have come across in one way or another. Um, so that was a new story that was originally published in the Swiss news outlet Das Magazin. And basically, in a nutshell, what the authors claim is that the Trump presidential campaign had used detailed psychological profiles of millions and millions of voters um, in the US to target them with highly personalized advertising um, on Facebook. And the goal was not only to kind of convince um, Trump supporters to go out and vote for Trump, but also to kind of discourage um, Hillary voters to go out on election day and put in their vote. Um, so I mean, it's, it's kind of questionable whether that story is true simply because we don't have any data, so it's very not open source um, in that sense. Um, but it clearly put digital psychometrics um, in the spotlight. And it's kind of now known around the world. And that's why I want to kind of talk about what is digital psychometrics? How does it work? And what could be the benefits, but also like the challenges that we experience by now being able to predict someone's kind of highly intimate psychological characteristics from their online behavior? OK, so psychometrics really means that we're trying to assess someone's psychological traits, something like their personality, their IQ, their life satisfaction. Um, and the way that we did that traditionally was that we used questionnaire measures. So we would give people a questionnaire that says, I talk to a lot of different people at parties, and now tell us how much you agree with that statement. And what we were really getting at is basically people's self-perception. So they told us about how they saw themselves. And you can, I mean, it's quite obvious that that's a bit problematic for various reasons. And I just want to kind of briefly talk about two. So the first one is that, well, people lie. Um, so especially if there's a lot of stake at stake when you kind of apply to a job, I doubt that many people would say that they strongly agree to the statement, I make a mess of things. So it's very, very easy to kind of misrepresent on these questionnaires. Um, and the second problem is that it's very difficult to scale. So kind of completing one of these tests takes between five minutes up to an hour. So we can, like as researchers, we can easily invite people to the laboratory, have them complete the questionnaire, maybe do that for like 20, 50 people. But if you want to do that for millions and millions of people, then it gets a bit problematic. Now what digital psychometrics, and this is something that's only been around for, yeah, maybe like the last five years, so what we're trying to do is to kind of get away from giving people questionnaires and asking them about their self-perception, but we're trying to look at what people actually do out there in the real world. So kind of which websites do they visit, what do they do in their social media profile, and what do they spend, uh, what kind of stuff do they buy with their credit cards, or even just what is their phone recording in terms of geolocation and physical activity. And we know from research um, that we can actually successfully predict someone's psychological traits from something like personal websites, from tweets, Facebook likes, status updates, and profile pictures. And in a way, it's not very surprising because everything that you do out there basically tells us a lot about your personal preferences, your habits, what you do in your everyday life, um, and how that then translates into something like more stable psychological traits. And I just want to give you an example. So that's Apply Magic Sauce is an API um, that we developed at the Psychometric Center, and it's based on the models that we developed. The name, basically, um, we came up with a name because people asked us, so how do you, how do you make these predictions? And we're like, got a bit sick of it. So we're like, oh, you just take data, you apply a bit of magic sauce, and then you have the, the psychological profiles. So that's how we came to that name. And I just want to show you how it works. So how can we get, how can you use it, because it's, it's free online, everybody can use it. So how can you get from something like Facebook likes to like a psychological profile? So basically what happens if you go on applymagicsauce.com, um, 
You can click on predict my profile, so that's open to everybody. It's absolutely free of charge. And then you can donate different types of data. So you can donate your Facebook profile, you can donate your Twitter data. Now, if you click here on connect with Facebook, and um, this is my profile now. I've all, I'm already logged in, so I didn't have to put in my login details. And um, so you can see it's connected to Facebook. If you click on make a prediction, Basically, in a few seconds, it scrapes your Facebook profile, takes your likes, takes your status updates, and turns it into a psychological profile. So you can do that from all the sources that you have or the individual ones and that are available in, in your kind of profile. So you can see it predicts stuff like gender, so it's pretty close um, for me in that one. Um, age, I mean, psychological gender, somewhere in the middle. Big five personality traits. So this one, in that case, my Facebook suggests that I'm kind of liberal and artistic, I'm a bit more introverted, and a bit more laid back and the, and, and the average. So all of you can do that if you just click on Apply Magic Sauce. It gives you a description of what your profile means um, in terms of your psychology, also predicts intelligence, a bit above average, that's promising, life satisfaction a bit lower, <laughs> not so surprising working as an academic. And it kind of basically predicts a whole bunch of other stuff. So check it out. And really, that just takes a few seconds. So you don't have to sit down, complete like um, questionnaires for half an hour, but really just log in with Facebook, and then you get at least a rough idea of what your psychological profile looks like. OK, so the question is, how does that work? So what's behind um, our prediction AM engine, Apply Magic Sauce, but also other prediction engines, so there's IBM StatSocial that does um, pretty much um, similar prediction. Uh, predictions. So it all started um, with the My Personality Facebook app. So My Personality was set up by one of my colleagues in Cambridge who didn't have anything to do during his summer in 2007. So he set up this app um, that allowed people to take real psychometric tests. So they could kind of complete a personality questionnaire, IQ questionnaire, life satisfaction, um, and they got immediate uh, responses on there, and they get immediate feedback on their responses. So they completed a questionnaire, and right there was feedback um, on their personality or whatever they had completed. Now, when he did that, he actually wanted to collect data of maybe a 1,000 people, maybe some of his friends. Um, but people loved the feedback so much that they shared it on Facebook, um, he, and he ended up collecting a data set of 7 million people, completely free of charge, simply because people really like to learn about themselves, and they like to know themselves. And um, so what we have now is this database that has psychometric test responses on something like personality, values, life satisfaction of around 7 million um, Facebook users around the world. Now, what's so amazing about this data set for people who are interested in data is that at the end of the, like after people had received feedback, they were asked whether they would voluntarily share their Facebook profile information with us um, for research purposes. And about 50% of people did so. So for about 3.5 million users, we actually have their self-perception in terms of psychological characteristics, and we also have their Facebook profile data. So we know what they liked on Facebook, what they post on Facebook. We have access to their profile and pictures and basically their public profile. And now this is the, like, this is the interesting part. And I'm not going to go into, into details here because I'm sure that pretty much all of you know more about that than I do. But basically, once you have this behavior on the one hand, and you have someone's psychological um, characteristics on the other hand, you can start building models, right? So whether it's a simple linear regression, or it kind of gets more complex um, into neural networks or something. And basically, you can kind of try and take someone's behavior um, and predict their psychological profile without them having to complete a questionnaire. And like, if you want to know more about the, the models, feel free to kind of come and see me afterwards. But what I want to do is basically show you some of the relationships that we found in the data that really show, and it's very obvious, um, how people of different personalities differ in the way that they behave online. See, okay, so this is um, a word cloud um, of the words and status updates that are most strongly correlated with the personality trait of extroversion. So extroverted people are those who kind of love to be social, they love to hang out with others, they're optimistic, enthusiastic, and you can see that in, in the words, right? So extroverts um, talk about parties, amazing, love, weekend, tonight, um, so they seem to be having um, a pretty good time. If you compare that to the introverted word cloud, which I think most of us will be <laughs> 
probably somewhere in the introverted um, cloud here, you can see that it's very different. So introversion associated with talking about computers, anime, internet, reading, books. Um, and this is like on a very basic level, this is just counting words, right? So you don't need any rocket science, you don't need any complex machine learning algorithms to see that there's something in the way that people behave online that's related to their personality. Now it gets even better. Um, so this one, so high agreeableness is one of the personality traits that distinguishes between people who care a lot about their social relationships, who are trusting, who are empathetic, um, and kind of warm and welcoming. So those people, Again, this is like, it's kind of stereotypical, but it also, this is what we find in the data. So they talk about family, wonderful, amazing, and um, beautiful and happy, so they're just very grateful in general. And now word of warning, and the word cloud for the low agreeableness, which is basically people who are more competitive and more critical, looks very, very different. <laughs> and again, this is nothing that we came up with. This is just what you see in the data. So those are the words that are most strongly correlated, and I'm not going to go through all of them now. I just to give you the, the pleasure of that. But you can see again that it's, it's very obvious how different personalities relate to, to online behavior. You can do the same thing for likes. So just um, as an example, again, introversion and extroversion, because that's like introverts, again, talking about computers seems to be a, a big common theme here. So Final Fantasy, Battlestar Galactica, and extroversion, those are people who hang out um, and love to be around other people, so they like to meet new people, socializing parties. So this just are just um, official Facebook pages. So it's not if one of your friends posts a cat video and you're like, yeah, I like that. So those are just official pages, so in terms of like, I don't know, BBC um, or CNN. Okay, the latest development, which I think is extremely interesting, is that you can do predictions of someone's personality simply based on faces. So the profile pictures that we have available on, um, on our, in our My Personality database, and we're used to kind of make predictions from faces of someone's personality. And this is basically just the AI dreaming of faces of introverts and extroverts, so those are the faces that the computer predicted to be most introverted and extroverted. And again, you can see very obvious differences that make a lot of sense. So the introverts have glasses, look a bit more shy and reserved, whereas the extroverts probably have their hair dyed because it's like much more blonde. And then the picture of the introverted ones, and also maybe wear contact lenses because they have like blue eyes, whereas um, introverts have um, brown eyes. So again, like whatever kind of digital footprint you take, there's a pretty good chance that it's in some way related to something like psychology, personality, intelligence. Okay, now the question is, how accurate is it? Um, and I don't, kind of, I don't want to go into too much detail, but the, the, the way that we usually assess the accuracy of a prediction model is we compare the computer-based prediction to the self-perception of the participant. Um, and when you kind of look across different personality traits, different footprints, the accuracy is usually around a correlation of 0.5 or 0.6. Now, the thing is that 0 0.5, 0 0.6, is that good, is that bad? Um, it's really difficult to say. So what my colleagues did, and I think this is actually a very nice way of illustrating the power um, of computer algorithms, is they compared it to the judgments of people in our environment. So how good are our work colleagues, our friends, our family members, our partners, at judging our personality in comparison to how good the computer is? And what this, So this is just uh, examples for Facebook likes. So the computer needs around 10 Facebook pages to be better than someone's work colleague. Needs about 65 pages to be better than someone's friend. About 120 to be better than someone's family member. And around 250 to be better than someone's spouse. And now the average number of likes at the time we conducted the study was 230. So the computer is basically better than everybody except kind of a little bit worse than our partner and spouse which is, for me, basically insane, because the computer only has the Facebook likes, right? And usually you spend a lot of time with your friends, a lot of time with your family and your partner, so they should technically have a very good idea um, of who you are as a person, yet the computer is pretty much, has pretty much the same accuracy just by looking at your Facebook likes. Okay, so now, how can we use like, these insights, digital psychometrics, um, in action? So what, can, what are the applications? 
um, of being able to predict someone's psychological profile. And the main message is really that I think it helps us to kind of personalize services across the whole board so we can use it for targeted marketing and healthcare and education because the more we know um, about the person, about their personal needs and preferences, the better we'll be able um, to tailor the services that we offer um, to those preferences. Okay, so I just want to go very briefly to the first two to give you an idea of how I see digital psychometrics working out um, in practice. So what we did, or like the question that we were interested in is can we use the knowledge of someone's psychological characteristics to increase the effectiveness of digital marketing? So that's going back to the, to the Trump story where they kind of tried to target people based on their personality and really kind of increase the persuasiveness of their messaging simply by taking these characteristics into account. And we didn't advertise, uh, well we didn't promote Trump, uh, we promoted something that's quite far away um, an online beauty retailer in the UK. Um, and what we did is we simply came up um, with a few extroverted messages and a few introverted messages. So you can see the extroverted messages, there was always something going on, people were kind of having a good time together, um, and the in introverted ads, it was like usually one person in a quiet setting. Now what we did is we ran actual Facebook campaigns um, over the course of seven days where we targeted introverted and extroverted users with these different types of messages. So over the course of the seven days, we attracted about six million impressions, so that's the number of times the ad was shown on Facebook, around 10,000 clicks and about 400 purchases on the beauty retailer's um, website. I just want to give you two metrics. So basically what we saw is that when you match the message that you use to promote a product to people's psychological characteristics, we see higher conversion rates, so people purchase more often, and they also generate more revenue um, for the company. And this is really simple, right? So it's exactly the same product. The only thing that we're changing is actually the way that we communicate um, with people based on their psychological profile. Now, you can do that to kind of promote consumer products. You could do the same thing in the context of political campaigns, in the context of healthcare. Okay, the second um, topic that I think is extremely interesting and extremely important these days um, is healthcare. And just one example is that we can now predict um, whether someone is likely to, um, to develop a depression simply by looking at their smartphone. So if we take into account um, their activity in terms of where they are, how much physical activity there is, and um, how much they sleep, how much they interact with other people, all stuff that's kind of passively collected on your phone while you carry it around, pretty much 24 hours um, a day can tell us whether or not you're more likely than the average person to develop a depression. And if you think about that, the people who develop a, de uh, a depression are usually not the ones who would go out and seek help. That is actually really useful because we can actively help those people who are in a vulnerable situation. And this was a new story that I think is extremely interesting and it very nicely for me kind of shows both the positives like potential, but also the danger for abuse, um, which was like Facebook um, was being accused of um, doing research on um, depressed teens, so people like teens experiencing um, anxiety or stress, um, and then being basically being exploited for targeting. Now, if you think about it, this is actually an amazing chance. So if Facebook is doing research trying to identify people who are at risk, well, if that information was being used to kind of help those, those teenagers who are probably not going to go and see their parents because they're having a bad time, then on the one hand, that's an amazing opportunity that could actually be used to help those um, teenagers. But obviously, it also has the whole other dark side where knowing, it, like having information um, on something like that could be abused to exploit weaknesses in people's characters. But like for me, it's really, when I read this news story, I was like, well, obviously there is potential for abuse, but don't kind of say that it's bad in general because it's a technology and if we can help those people, the benefits that we could reap would be like basically equaling out the potential dangers in my point of view. Okay, so now a look into the future of digital psychometrics. Um, as all of you know, there's basically more and more data collected on us every second. So I think the future is really kind of taking people's more stable psychological traits that we can get from something like Facebook profiles, the websites that people visit, but then combining it um, with information about the context that the person is in. 
So kind of really looking at the person at, in real time. So what is that? Okay, we know that this person is extroverted, but what is he doing right now? Is he in an extroverted situation? Is he in a good mood? And what does that tell us about how we should communicate with that person? How maybe prone he is to kind of showing a certain type of behavior? And the person that I think has very nicely expressed why this is um, so important is one of my favorite comedians, Louis C.K. And I'll just let him give you, give you the spiel. Just the constant, nobody takes in life unless it comes through this. Yes. Like whenever I see a televised event that's a huge, like the, the Olympics opening ceremony or a Times Square at, at uh, midnight uh, on, on New Year's Eve, everybody, they see seas of people all looking at it through their phone. Yeah. Like there's explosions and acrobats, but they're looking at it through a little three inch screen. Like I think if Jesus comes back, and starts telling everyone everything, it'll just, everybody's just gonna be twittering and they won't be like, I am Christ and I have returned. Oh my God, Jesus is right in front of me, right now, I swear to God. Yes, yeah, so I think you very nicely summarizes the fact that most of our lives are now mediated by these digital devices. So whether it's communicating with our friends or just capturing the moments that are most important to us, most of it is recorded by like our smartphone, by wearable devices. And this is only going to get more. Um, and I think it's on the one hand, um, and this is actually also my, my conclusion, I mean on the one hand it ex it's extremely exciting that we know so much about people's lives now, but also with that great power that we have comes a great responsibility. Um, and I really mean that because I think for a lot of people it's extremely scary because they don't know what's happening, they don't know how stuff works, they don't know what's actually possible. Um, and I think it, it's true for all of us in the room, but certainly also people in academia, is that we get, need to get a lot better at openly communicating and transparently communicating, first of all, what's possible, and then also how the technologies that we develop are going to affect people's lives. Because what they hear at the moment is stories like the news story about Trump or the news story about Facebook, how those technologies are kind of ruining their lives, making them prone to being manipulated and basically posing a, a huge threat to their lives. Now I think what we need to do is basically show them the other side. So show them that yes, these technologies exist and we're working on them to kind of make them better, but actually there's so much potential for kind of helping you make better decisions, helping you kind of lead healthy and happy lives, and we're not doing that behind the scenes, but we're actually openly communicating um, to the public what's possible and what we're currently working on. And I hope that we can all do, do that together, and I think obviously the open source movement um, is one of the movements where we can see that, like at least going in the right direction. Um, and this is, is my vision for the future, that it's kind of people like you and me working together, academia working together with industry and making that change happen. Well, thank you very much.